you are welcome to my channel thanks for visiting remembering to subscribe sharing my presentations and listening to this very one today we'll be addressing a big topic but we are all familiar with it that is diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus should not kill you should not kill anyone if you are ready to fight it and you can ask me how do you mean let's go before diving deeply into diabetes mellitus we should know that we don't have only diabetes mellitus under the diabetes definition it's possible that the individual could be dealing with diabetes insipidus so there are two broad types diabetes mellitus diabetes insipidus so the question is is this patient having diabetes mellitus is it diabetes insipidus we will know never one thing is common to both of them that is they both produce large urine in diabetes insipidus large amount of diluted urine will be produced it may be central diabetes insipidus in that case there will be lack of antidiuretic hormone called vasopressin this is as a result of trouble or dysfunction happening at the hypothalamic or with the pituitary gland these will occur in the brain right and we can trace the cause of this sometimes to central nervous system infection or trauma to the central nervous system if it is not central diabetes insipidus it might be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in, th in that case the trouble will occur downstairs at the washroom or toilet depending on where you are you no know, depending on the name you call it toilet or washroom and i call it downstairs because it's not happening in the brain i call the brain upstairs right so downstairs the trouble is happening right inside the kidneys in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus here there is no adequate response to the instructions from the upstairs meaning there's lack of sufficient response to the already produced antidiuretic hormone that is the problem unlike the central where there is inadequate production of antidiuretic hormone in nephrogenic there is enough antidiuretic hormone but there's lack of sufficient response we can find that in lithium trouble when lithium causes diabetes insipidus it will be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so sometimes i test you know, by my functioning hypothalamus that may lead to high water intake and of course that will later lead to excretion or increased urine production as the case is in dipsogenic diabetes insipidus dipsogenic diabetes insipidus is pointing to the fact that there is damage to the test mechanism in the hypothalamus it might be gestational diabetes insipidus that could be treated with desmopressin insipidus simply means this is tasteless while mellitus means it is sweet both from latin word in fact in the olden days the way they test for diabetes mellitus or insipidus is that they will notice when the affected person has urinated ants will come around know the place where the individual with diabetes mellitus has you know dumped the urine and that would not be the case in diabetes insipidus so the 
presence or congregation of ants around Urine on the ground will give the clue that that is containing sugar. Okay, now diabetes mellitus. We've gone briefly through diabetes insipidus, right? So to those who had in the past known that there's diabetes, now you know that it could be diabetes insipidus, not dealing with high sugar in your blood, not dealing with high sugar in your urine, but it could be diabetes mellitus, the one you are familiar with, that is the one with high sugar. Now, let's get down to diabetes mellitus. This is a metabolic disorder where glucose intake by cells for fuel is impaired. So there is excess glucose in the blood, excess in the urine, with the associated complications. Now diabetes mellitus fully. You've had about type 1 diabetes mellitus, right? Okay, let's briefly review that here. Uh, number of people with type 1 diabetes mellitus with ancantosis nigricans will be minimal. Okay, ancantosis nigricans. So it will be a form of rash at the back of the neck and some parts of the body. You know. well, let's just go on. Later on, we'll talk more about that. The onset of type 1 diabetes mellitus could be acute and the first sign that the individual is having type 1 might be he or she is down with diabetic ketoacidosis. Admitted in the hospital, emergency room, while doing investigations, then they'll be, oh, this is DKA, oh, high glucose level, oh, high ketones, oh, this is type 1. That might be. The first presentation ever. Here, positive family history is not such a strong factor, but still possible. So about 10% could be linked to family history. Yeah. Here, autoimmune conditions will be highly recognized, or it might be majorly due to autoimmune conditions. HLA DR3 DR4. It can be idiopathic sometimes in medicine when we have tried to get a cause of a particular disease condition and we are unable to do that, we conclude and hide under the definition idiopathic or known cause. This is common when we are considering all races in the world, is common in whites than the rest. I will tell you where uh, whites will have less problem in a bit. But when it comes to type 1, and you want to compare Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, whites, you find type 1 more in whites than the rest. But we should tell ourselves the truth, it is worldwide. So it is found in Blacks, found in Asians, found in whites, found in Hispanics, Latinos, found everywhere. But more in whites. That is type one. Here, the pancreas is in trouble. We'll be dealing with a situation where pancreatic uh, function is insufficient. And with pancreatic antibodies, in about you no know, 80% of cases, the pancreas would have been destroyed before we will be seeing the signs and symptoms of diabetes in this patient. Let me repeat. Here, the problem is majorly within the pancreas. The pancreas is failing. As well as cells of longer hands are not working well. Okay? We can pick antibodies, you no know, pancreatic antibodies in these patients. But before the young lady or the young man with type 1 diabetes mellitus will be showing signs and symptoms of diabetes or DKA, 80% destruction would have occurred in that pancreas. So you can see why we opt for nothing but insulin that the pancreas can no longer produce. Be be because 
before we were able to pick that, the pancreas must have been destroyed a lot, 80% destruction. Here, when we assay the insulin and C-peptides, there'll be low insulin, there'll be low C-peptides, okay? I will uh, quickly go into that. Well, let me give you the reason why there is trouble with insulin and C-peptides. C-peptide is a part of pro-insulin that is broken before it is also secreted along with the same insulin, okay? And we are not going to get this from exogenous insulin. So if someone introduces um, insulin from outside, we will not get this picture, okay? It is only when we are dealing with the insulin produced inside the pancreas, okay? Gila's cell will be stimulated by carbohydrate ingestion mm, or certain drugs like uh, secretor goggles like sulfonurias will stimulate the beta cells to produce insulin, okay? And then insulin and C-peptide will be in ratio 1 to 1 molar, okay? Then insulin is largely cleared by the liver. But C-peptide is mainly cleared by the kidney. So insulin to C-peptide, when we take the blood peripherally, is less than 1.0. Why that? C-peptide is not affected by the liver. So liver is not clearing it. If insulin is introduced from outside exogenously, there will be hypoglycemia, correct? There will be increased insulin, correct? But the value of C-peptide will drop. Okay, pancreatic-induced insulinoma is the one that will lead to both increased C-peptides and increased insulin. I think we got it right now. So the main treatment here would then be insulin in type 1. And then the age, where we're going to find type 1 will mostly be childhood. But we can find it in adult if the result uh, is because it is caused by autoimmune. So the autoimmune may develop later and destroy the pancreas, and then we'll find low insulin, low C-peptide, and the treatment will be you know, insulin alone, exogenously. Then the diagnosis will still be type 1, though the individual is not a child might be an adult. Autoimmune can cause type 1 diabetes in adults. Now, type 2. Oh, so somebody is saying I'm familiar with this. Mm -hmm -hmm. Well, let's go through this together. Type 2, remember I said acatosis nigricans will be minima in type 1. Here, it will be significant. It will be present in almost 85% of type 2 diabetes mellitus patients and candosis nigricans. The onset here is slowly. Remember I said in type 1, the onset is acute. And the first presentation might even be diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll later on go into uh, aposmolar, hyperglycemic state, and so on or non-ketotic coma, and so on. That may be the first time, too, particularly in individuals that will not be going to their physicians on time, and will not be telling anybody that I'm peeing more, I'm feeling thirsty more, I'm losing weight, and so on. We'll go into details of all those later on. About 10% of patients with type 2 diabetes will actually have ketones. Well, this is to my friends in medical school, uh, some will believe that type 1 is associated with ketones. Type 2, no ketones. That's wrong. It's only that the percentage will be low. About 10% can still have ketones in type 2 diabetes mellitus. The family history is pretty strong here. Remember I said on type 1 that family history is about, you know, in, in about 10%. Here is in about 80%. 80%. So, family history is very important here. 
and type 2 will occur in all races. Okay, remember I said the other time that type 1 will be in all races, but common in wives more than the rest. Here, it is common in all other races than whites. So, type 2 is common among blacks, Hispanics, and natives, Native Americans, Native Canadians is common. But we should tell ourselves the truth. This is a worldwide problem. Here, the other time in type 1, I said we we'll have to give insulin, right? Here, this is suffering in the means of plenty. Insulin is already here. The problem is there's resistance to insulin. Okay? Insulin resistance is the problem in type 2, not the lack of insulin production. Here, they have good pancreas. As a matter of fact, by the time we go into certain medications that be uh, useful for the treatment of type 2, we will see that some of them, and majority of them will actually need a good pancreas. No secret goggles. So, they have good pancreas here. Mm -hmm. Take that. They do. But there's resistance to insulin. Here, they will have high C peptide and high insulin. Why that? The pancreas is working well. Beta cells are working well. Isolate of Lange has no problem. Then where's the problem? The, yes, there's suffering in the midst of plenty, right? But greater than 75% of people with type 2 will be obese. Or BMI will be you know, greater than the normal for their age and height. Okay? The age of presentation here will be variable. Unlike type 1 that I said, a childhood mainly, but it can occur in adults if autoimmune services in adult age and it destroys the pancreas. Here in type 2, I'll just leave it as variable in the sense that before the old, old, old medical test books will say in adult, now type 2 diabetes mellitus could be picked in children. Yes. Uh, once a child is obese, particularly teenagers, they can come down with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Okay, the third example of diabetes mellitus will be borderline or impaired diabetes mellitus. I'll not waste your time. We'll still you know, get more info about that later. Then gestational diabetes mellitus, pregnant women. Drug induced. So you're asking me now that certain medications that some people are taking can you know, teach them to diabetes mellitus or can worsen it. No, don't worry. We'll, we'll get details in a bit. Then, maturity onset diabetes of the young. We'll get full info in a bit. Now, the maturity onset diabetes of the young. Like we've seen of the young, right? It's going to happen in people less than 25 years. It is non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, like type 2. Autosomal dominant will be the pattern of inheritance. So, meaning, all you need is one gene from either of the parents. You don't need the two parents to produce you know, the genes before you can come down with it. No autoantibodies here. So, there's no autoimmune condition destroying the pancreas here. And it is just about 5% of all diabetes mellitus cases. The seventh example of diabetes mellitus will be hepatogenous diabetes mellitus. Here, let me first of all ask you, have you heard about that before? Someone will say no, right? I'm not faulting you, you know, that's perfectly okay. Here, we'll go into details, but Check my channel through this link. You will find full presentation on hepatogenous diabetes. Right here. Just click on this very link. It will take you to my channel. And you will pick the pieces of info on hepatogenous diabetes. But for now, 
Let's continue. Okay, we want to talk more about the hepatogenous diabetes, right? So this is the liver. And the reason why I've brought it here is that we should know the organ we are dealing with, okay? So liver. Now, hepatogenous diabetes. The name implies that the damage to the liver by cirrhosis can lead to diabetes. This is because there is an impaired glucose regulation caused by the loss of liver function. This is curable. Unlike type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is curable. And why that? You know in a bit. Liver cirrhosis and diabetes in hepatogenous diabetes. Is it type 2 diabetes mellitus or is it hepatogenous diabetes mellitus? If you are confused, then we will answer it here that it is not type 2, it is hepatogenous. And why that? In hepatogenous diabetes, the onset will be after chronic liver disease must have been diagnosed, or at least about the same time that the individual has been diagnosed with chronic liver disease that the di diagnosis of diabetes mellitus will also occur. That is not to say the person couldn't have you know, come down with type 1 with, because of autoimmune um, disease somewhere not yet known, or it's not because the person is not having type 2, if there's genetic constitution, obesity, and the rest, that is not what we are saying. But what we are saying here right now today is that it is because there is liver problem here. And that is the cause of this diabetes. Here, you will know more that it is not the other types of diabetes because the risk factors that will point to type 2 diabetes in this patient are not there. Are you getting the point now? Okay. Every factors that could lead to type 1 are not found here. And this is not a woman that is pregnant. It's not gestational diabetes. So you have ruled out, look for, and you couldn't find the risk factors that could lead to diabetes mellitus in this patient. So there is less of those risk factors that you can handle, you can point to, you can see that there's chronic liver disease already diagnosed. And you know, this is hepatogenous diabetes. The clinical features of liver cirrhosis will be present. Okay, you know where we're going now. Less of risk factors for diabetes mellitus, features of liver cirrhosis are present. Then the iron risks of hypoglycemia will be greater than in type 2 diabetes mellitus. So they will have more hypoglycemia. Why that? We'll see in a bit. Then you will be more convinced again that it is a pathogenous diabetes because liver treatment, when you treat the chronic liver disease diagnosed, the treatment will improve the diabetes mellitus. Liver transplantation will cure the hepatogenous diabetes. Type 2 diabetes mellitus is incurable, but hepatogenous diabetes is curable. And how? We cure that with liver transplantation. What are the clinical features of hepatogenous diabetes? Symptoms will start after the onset of liver disease. It may be some clinical symptoms, likely no more fasting blood sugar will be paid, but when you do your OGTT, it will be abnormal. The level of hemoglobin A1C will be low. There will be apparent or obvious complications of liver cirrhosis or liver failure. Then, there will be less microangiopathic complications or futures associated with diabetes mellitus. Still talking about hepatogenous diabetes, 
there will be increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma because the problem is in the liver with liver cirrhosis. And one of the complications of liver cirrhosis is hepatocellular carcinoma. Also, hepatic encephalopathy, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, sepsis, varicella hemorrhage, all these will occur in liver cirrhosis, renal dysfunction, and mortality that is associated with liver cirrhosis is what is going to be associated here. In fact, because of the presence of this diabetes, then there will be increased mortality in liver cirrhosis here. What are the possible causes of pathophysiology of hepatogenous diabetes? There's controversy over that because there's no clear called documented pathophysiology of hepatogenous diabetes. And nothing so serious about that when it is well known by many people that will definitely come in the near future. But there's decreased insulin clearance. And why that? Because of hepatocellular functional loss. And that is the reason why apoglycemia Will be very very uh, serious here and it will be profound. Pancreatic beta cells distortion or dysfunction is a possibility. Increased level of advanced glycation and products occurring here and there is likelihood of insulin resistance due to chronic liver disease. Treatment of hepatogenous diabetes. This is very difficult to treat. Why that? Many of the oral hypoglycemic agents will have hepatotoxicity. Remember, the liver is already in trouble. Now, you won't give medication that will add salt to the injury, right? Insulin should be administered with great caution. Why that? They are prone to hypoglycemia already. So, oral hypoglycemic agent will lead to more hypoglycemia, but you can try the following. Just know that, so be careful too. That's why I say it's very difficult to treat. By guanine, metformin, alpha glucosidase inhibitors like acabose, dipeptide peptidase 4 inhibitors like linagliptin. You can try that. But the best advice is to have a liver transplantation because that will lead to cure and it's the only cure. Now, pancreatic lesions. What is the trouble with my pancreas? Remember I said in uh, type one, by the time type one patient is showing signs and symptoms of type one diabetes mellitus like DKA, that may be the first reason why they are presenting, 80%, 80% of the pancreas must have been destroyed. And in type two, they have good pancreas, but there is insulin resistance. Now, the pancreas. It is the most important organ as far as diabetes mellitus is concerned. Why? That is the manufacturing company that produces the insulin. Distortion of the pancreas will lead to type 1. In type 2, some medications would need a functioning pancreas. We could see how important the pancreas is here. And they are called secretor goggles. For example, sulfonylureas. Now, let's go through the possible problems that could lead to trouble in the pancreas or with the pancreas that would then end up in diabetes mellitus, it could be cystic fibrosis. The full presentation on cystic fibrosis by me is right here. You can click on this very link. That will lead you to full info on cystic fibrosis. It may be cancer of the pancreas. Mm -hmm. And insulin production becomes impaired. Of course. It could be chronic pancreatitis that is caused by virus by cytomegalovirus or rubella, or it could be autoimmune-induced chronic pancreatitis. It might be hereditary pancreatitis, 
leading to diabetes mellitus and cancer of the pancreas. Okay, still on possible problems with the pancreas, could be surgery involving the pancreas, could be hemochromatosis. For full presentation on hemochromatosis, you can copy this very link and you will get into that on my channel right here. So hemochromatosis simply means the ion is being deposited in tissues and the tissues could be the liver or the pancreas, giving us bronze color and diabetes mellitus. And might be as a result of increased triglycerides. That will cause pancreatitis. And the pancreatitis will also cause increased triglycerides. So they are both dangerous, right? But for full info on the association between triglycerides and pancreatitis, please go through this link. I have full presentation on acute pancreatitis and triglycerides. Okay, not done yet as per the you know, possible causes of destruction to the pancreas. Uh, that may be chromosomal anomalies or genetic syndrome, e.g. clinifetal syndrome. Individuals with clinifetal syndrome can have insulin resistance and that could lead to type 2 diabetes mellitus. They, most of the time, they usually have weight increase. And remember, type 2 will have problem, particularly with people you know, that are obese, okay? There may be inflammation in clinifetal syndrome of the pancreas caused by autoimmune, and they may have high lipid. For example, they can have high triglycerides. Of course, someone with increased weight, you expect high lipid, right? And remember, high triglycerides will lead to you know, pancreatic uh, destruction, okay? pancreatitis. In Down syndrome, they may come down with type 1 diabetes mellitus because of autoimmune diseases affecting the early cells of the pancreas. Remember, Down syndrome people may come down with Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. These are both autoimmune conditions. And in medicine, we believe that once you are able to pick one autoimmune disease, you should look for other autoimmune diseases. So if you are able to pick Hashimoto's, or graves and Down syndrome, then there may be autoimmune distortion of the pancreas also. Still on possible troubles with the pancreas, it might be porphyria. In acute cases, this may be associated with pancreatitis and liver failure. Remember, the hepatogenous diabetes mellitus, right? And internal syndrome, they can come down with mucinous cystic neoplasms affecting the pancreas also. Now, drug-induced. But get this right before we go through the list. When I said drug-induced, if you're on these medications for a long time, then you have to be checking the glucose level because they can alter the metabolism of glucose, you know, the pancreas, the liver, and so on. So, that's why it's important. So I'm not saying once you're on these medications, maybe you are need for one week, two weeks, then that will teach you into diabetes mellitus. No. But if you're on it for a long time, then you must check the glucose level, you know, periodically. But if you are already diagnosed with diabetes and you are on these medications, it can worsen the diabetes mellitus for you, for sure or at least increase you know, the rate at which you take your medications and the dosage. Okay, let's go through the list. Antipsychotics. First generation antipsychotics like venotoxin. Also, second generation antipsychotics like onlazapine, clozapine, quetiapine, risperidone, paliperidone. But, the prazidone and aripiprazole from second generation will have lower likelihood of you know, glucose metabolism during vasopressors that can increase glucose or worsen diabetes mellitus will be epinephrine. That is, if you are in North America, it is known as adrenaline in Europe or noepinephrine or noadrenaline in Europe can 
wasn't abysmalizers. Still going through the list of the drugs that could induce or wasn't abysmalizers will be pentamidine. I have a full presentation on that right here. Please check my channel. Dapsone, I also have a full presentation. Rivampin, fluoroquinolones, mosifluzazine, suprofluzazine, gatifluzazine. I have full presentation on this and this here, Dapsone and pentamidine. I have not put the links there because it will become cool. So imagine putting links behind you know, each of them. Still on the list of drugs that one can easily say not too good for DM will be a combined oral right contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, that is to you know, menopausal women, luprolide, gosrelin, diuretics, like my tolazone, Adoclotazine, Clotalidone, and in the palm. Others would be the azoxide, azotretinoin for the treatment of acne in teenagers, HIV with highly active antiviral therapy, but not all of them, immunosuppressant like sarolimol, sacrolimol, and sacrosporin. The list has not ended. It also includes beta blockers like propanolol, etanolol, metoprolol. If you need to use beta blockers, and you can use this because your patient is diabetic, then you can go for cavedilol instead of any of this. Except you are going to use this for a short time. Okay. Still, tezamorelin. That is a grifter. That is used for excess belly fat reduction. Though you are happy the belly fat is down, but you may have your diabetes you know, going bad, okay? Somatotropin, a recombinant human growth hormone, niacin for your lipid treatment, right? And statins. Statins, we actually give that as part of the medications to treat no diabetes people will go into the list in a bit. They have less trouble, you no, know, causing the rain men as per glucose metabolism, but it's noteworthy that that is stated here. Cough syrup. Mm -hmm. Some people will not believe this, right? Cold and flu medications like the congestants, pseudoephedrine, sudafed, and phenylephrine. All these could worsen diabetes mellitus for you. The reason why I put this here is that this is easily overlooked. They are over the counter. You can just walk in anywhere and grab them. But if you are diagnosed with diabetes mellitus and you are fond of grabbing this all the time, drinking or tablet, anything, all the time, all the time, well, that might be responsible for the glucose level in you not being controlled easily. Highly concentrated caffeine. Oh, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear this. Oh, Tim Hortons everywhere, uh, Starbucks everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not against them, no, but listen to this. This can lead to increase in insulin resistance. That is when you are taking highly concentrated you no. Know, Type okay, and can decrease glucose utilization after eating. But you could see, please listen to this. Don't don't fight me yet. If you take caffeine, your coffee at moderate level, you have no problem like insulin resistance and glucose utilization decrease. No, no. So I highly concentrated caffeine will give you trouble but moderate level or mild level of caffeine consumption is okay as far as dm is concerned you are happy to hear that right mm -hmm. glucose staffs no why will you even be taking glucose staffs you only need it to reverse hypoglycemia if you're on treatment for diabetes mellitus. So, glucose tabs is life saving for diabetes patients, 
keep them in your bag, in your wallet, in your boxes. Once you uh, you are on medication, insulin, or oral hypoglycemic agents, and you're battling with hypoglycemia, I'll go into details of that in a bit. Then just grab this, and then you will live. Outside that, as far as diabetes is concerned, I mean diabetes mellitus because we have diabetes insipidus. You don't need glucose tabs. You don't need to be taking any. Now, diabetes. The big question is: Is it true? Who are you asking? Oh, okay. I'm asking myself, right? Is it true that my patient has diabetes? Or is it true that so so person I knew is diabetic? Okay, let's see. How are we going to get the answer? Okay, you are before the doctor, and now history will be taken. History of presenting illness. Okay, there must be these questions to know that you are diabetic or not. History of test. And you are drinking more water. So you are thirsty and you are drinking more. Increased urine production, polyuria. This is termed in medicine as polydipsia, right? Drinking more water. Peeing more, polyuria. Eating more, polyphagia. And at the same time, losing weight, weight loss. Blood vision, erectile dysfunction in men. In fact, that may be the first clue in most men on account of which investigations will be done, and then the diagnosis of type 2 will be made. And cantosis nigricans, dermatologists, will tell you, oh, man, your glucose level will be acid. And then they do it blood and urine and so on, and say, oh, you have type 2, and then referral will be given from dermatological clinic to endocrinological clinic. Poor wound healing. Oh, because immunity is down. Polyneuropathy, nocturnal diarrhea will see the reason why in a bit. DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis in type 1. Remember, I said earlier that that may be the first presentation in some patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus because they may not know. Hyperglycemic, hypersmolar, non ketotic coma. They are in coma, type 2. They didn't know that they are diabetic or not until the glucose level is acid. Still on history of presenting illness, any history of loss of consciousness, shortness of breath, palpitations, or chest pain. Why? We are already dealing with complications of diabetes, constipation, diarrhea, coronary artery disease like heart attack, hypertension, we need to ask about all this so we know whether this diabetes has even stayed long or not. Okay, we want to know about the lipid level, any high lipid, any food problems, any amputation already. Do you have ulcer right now? Any numbness, tingling, sensation, in your feet? Have you been admitted because you passed out? That is coma. How about your vision, impaired vision? Any kidney disease already diagnosed in the last few years? Past medical history. We want to know how many times have you been hospitalized? On account of what? Are you on any medication currently? Can you give me the list? Have you been diagnosed with hypertension? Do you know your blood pressure? Is it under control? Any thyroid disease currently? Any liver disease? Any kidney disease? Okay, further history will take us to delve into what is happening in your family. Remember, 10% of type 1 diabetes mellitus will be linked to family history, while 80% will be linked to family as far as type 2. Diabetes mellitus. So, any diabetes mellitus in your family, people obese, even yourself, pancreatic disease in type 1, DM in family mostly in type 2, obesity in type 2, autoimmune diseases type 1, social history, any stress in your life, 
obstruction sleep apnea. Some people cannot believe that obstruction sleep apnea causing DM and hypertension for them, right? Mm -hmm. You heard that now. Even causing myocardial infarction, that is heart attack. Street draws, don't kill yourself. Get out of that very bad habit. Stop crack cocaine, you know, amphetamine, fentanyl, and all of that. In fact, you can check my channel for full presentations on many, you know, street drugs already published by me. Smoking. Well, so, some people will find me now and say, oh, what has smoking got to do with diabetes mellitus? Okay, wait, wait. Smoking on its own is, is the strongest preventable risk factors for heart attack. Diabetes mellitus will give you what is known as coronary artery disease as macro complication of diabetes mellitus. Inside that is heart attack. So why are you helping the diabetes to kill you if you have diabetes and you're still smoking? Now, we've gone through the history. Now we want to do physical examination. Okay, general inspection, A to 2. And ophthalmoscopy. Remember, we've been saying blood vision, blood vision, blood vision sense. There are stages of distortions to your sight from diabetes. The same, like um, hypertension. Okay? We will inspect, check everything about cardiovascular system, about peripheral vascular disease. Then neuro will be done. Remember, neuropathy will occur here. Okay? Remember, we have macro uh, complications. We have macro. We'll go into the list of all of them later on. We will do feet examination here with our monofilm. Investigations to be done. Mm -hmm. Some people have clicked on this very presentation only because of this. All they want to know is what test should be done. Random blood sugar will be done today. Okay? Then we'll arrange for the fasting blood sugar with fasting lipid. And then we may do OGTT, particularly in pregnant women, and hemoglobin A1C, glycated hemoglobin. We will ask it for this, depending on how you are presenting, anyways. Still on investigation. If we are not sure, if you have not been labeled as type 1 or type 2, we will do C peptide and insulin, then we'll compare. Why that? I've explained before, but I won't be lazy not to go over it again. C peptide is a part of pro insulin that is broken before it is also secreted along with insulin. Okay, the C peptide will not be accurately measured if the insulin is given from outside. That is, if you have been injected with insulin, then it is not going to be sensible to be looking for C-peptide. We are going for the C-peptide only when we know and we are sure of that the insulin that we will ask it will be endogenously produced insulin by the beta cells. No, inside the pancreas itself. So when the beta cells are simulated because you have eaten food you know, rich in glucose, or you have taken certain medications that could shoot the insulin out, we call them secretor goggles, right? Then we'll be able to assay the C peptide insulin and compare. We will expect one to one, you know, osmolar, then we should remember that the clearance of insulin and uh, the C peptide will not be the same. Insulin will be cleared by the liver, while the C peptide will be cleared by the kidney. So that will create disparity when it comes to insulin to C peptide in peripheral blood. Okay, it will be less than 1.0. Why that? The C peptide uh, will be uh not we will escape you no know, the liver clearance it's not going to be affected by the liver so if insulin is given by a nurse 
no, you are injected or you inject yourself and then you have hypoglycemia and your insulin level is high, when we check the C-peptide, it will be low. So we will know what is happening to the pancreas as far as pancreas uh, capability to produce insulin is concerned when the C-peptide level is high at the same time that insulin is high. But if insulin is low and C-peptide level is also low, then we will know it is the pancreas that is in trouble. Um, as I wrote here, that is you ask me the question, renal glucose and why renal glucose is not diagnostic. You want to ask me now? Okay, I'll supply the answer. When we have renalysis and the glucose level is high, that is glycosuria, it might be because you've just taken two bottles of Pepsi or Coke or no um, ginger ale, I mean, Canada dry or whatever that is rich in glucose or just beverage, hot sugar, okay? The reason is that that's what you call transport maxima in physiology of the kidney. When that is exceeded, it will appear in the urine. The glucose will appear in the urine. So that is not diagnostic because any conditions under which the transport maxima for glucose could be exceeded in renal system will lead to glycosuria in the urine. So urine analysis is not diagnostic. That's why we always go for blood to match what is happening in the urine. The urine analysis can send us a motion to have fasting blood sugar down that is plasma, okay? And somebody is saying, what's your business if I complete blood can? Oh, the medications will be given. Some of them can lead to anemia, right? Mm -hmm. And we, 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 it's okay to even have complete uh, picture of what is happening in your system, okay? Further investigations will include liver function test. Remember pathogenous diabetes? Okay, let's see if the liver is in trouble. And of course, the medications we want to give, some of them are hepatotoxic, right? So albumin, INR, APTT, bilirubin, and liver enzymes. The reason why I put liver and liver enzymes is that there's difference between liver function and liver enzymes. Renal function test, you can do albumin to creatinine ratio or glomerular filtration rate. But if, even if you can't do that, we must do blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, urinalysis. That is not diagnostic, but it's going to be a pointer, like I've said, and of course, electrolytes. The pancreas. What can we do with pancreas? Well, you can do cholecystokinin pancreatic stimulation test. That would be a different topic for another day. But you can quickly go through lipase, amylase, and antibodies. Particularly, eyelid antibodies are pointing to type 1 diabetes mellitus. Triglycerides can have, because I've told you, acute pancreatitis and triglycerides, they are related. In fact, I have a separate full presentation on that on my channel. You can have ultrasound down CT scan to know what is happening to the pancreas. Still on investigations, any autoimmune condition going on here with your ESRC, reactive protein, antinuclear, antibody, and rheumatoid factor. Somebody is asking, what's a business? Oh, remember type 1 diabetes mellitus? You know, the possibility of autoimmune being the cause of that. And once you find one autoimmune condition in medicine, we must look for other autoimmune conditions. We're not done as for investigations yet. Oh, no, we are not done. We must have ophthalmoscopy done. Pervera vascular disease to be ruled out using PDA and carotid Doppler ultrasound. Thyroid gland should be investigated with thyroid stimulating hormone or full thyroid function test.
You're not done with investigations? I'm sorry, I'm not done. Why? Oh, let's see what's happening as per coronary artery disease. Let's have cardiac enzymes down. The EKG, the chest X-ray, and echo could be transthoracic. And if you are strongly, you no, know, uh, pressed to know that something is happening or is not happening, that a clot is already forming somewhere, you can have transesophageal echo down. Okay, the diagnosis. Somebody will say, "Oh, at last." Mm -hmm. Many patients will not have the classical symptoms, so don't let us be deceiving ourselves, okay? If you say polyuria, they will say no. Polydusia, yes. Polyphagia, no. Weight loss, no. That doesn't mean they don't have it. Mm -hmm. Depends on the degree of the damage already done, okay? So, urinalysis with ice sugar is not diagnostic. I've repeated this, or I've explained. It's not diagnostic. It is transport maxima that would you know, explain that in physiology. Okay, it is a difficult thing to tell somebody pretty bad news that you have diabetes mellitus. It's even more complicated to say, oh, you have type one or type two, but there are parameters to check and put together and then take the courage to tell the individual you have diabetes mellitus. So hemoglobin one c must be at least 6.5 and greater. And fasting plasma glucose must be 7.0 millimoles per liter and greater. Random blood sugar at 11.1 millimoles per liter or greater. OGTT at the second hour with 11.1 millimoles per liter or greater, all these put together, or at least these and these, or these and these and these will give us the, you know, what will be comfortable to say this is diabetes mellitus. But there's an entity known as pre-diabetes, meaning the individual is not fully labeled as having diabetes mellitus, but is on the verge of that, very close, pretty close. So if the fasting plasma glucose is between 6.1 to 6.9, has not reached 7.0, then that is impaired. The individual is having pre-diabetes, meaning anytime, if care is not taken, if certain uh, lifestyle changes are not made in type two, the individual will come down with full-blown diabetes in a very soon. Also, if OGTT is down and the second hour is between 7.8 to 11.05, not up to 11.1 or greater, then we cannot label the person as being diabetic, but pre-diabetic. So, at the corner, pretty close. Hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 to 6.4 percent. No, it's not yet 6.5 or greater. So the person is pretty close. In all these situations, we call it impaired fasting plasma glucose, impaired GTT, impaired hemoglobin A1C. Investigations to be done on follow up. Mm -hmm. This is one of the questions that will come up in some medical exams. Body weight and smoking cessation. We must be measuring the weight in type 2 and keep on canceling on smoking cessation and ask, okay? Hemoglobin A1C every three months, every three months. Albumin to kidney ratio for renal function every year. Food examination every year. Some doctors will actually do that every time the patient comes to the clinic. Dental examination every year. The dentist will make their money, right? The blood pressure should be, should be, you not know, anything 
130 over 80 millimeters of mercury and not above. So that is our target. And eye examination, you no, know, the ophthalmologist, you no, know, a referral will be you no know, sent to them. So every year you have to see them. Diabetes mellitus treatment. Oh, oh. Doctor, how can I get rid of this? Is that a question? Well, I think. Do I, do I really have an answer? Might be multiple answers. Let's see. In type two, first thing first, the first three months to six months, we will be dealing with lifestyle changes. So the first thing to do in type two is to educate the patient that this is a diagnosis and this is chronic. Chronic to lay people on the street means, oh, it is more horrible. No, they believe acute is mild. Chronic is more scary. No, acute is actually more serious in the medical field. And chronic means you've been living with it for a long time, or you're going to live with it for a long time. So lifestyle changes is the first thing to embark upon in type two. Get that weight down, weight loss. Your medications should be adjusted. We've gone through the list of medications that could worsen diabetes or surgery. Diet control with dietitians. You'll be given a pamphlet the day you are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, even type 1. Exercise. Start smoking. Psychotherapy to treat diabetes stress. Mm -hmm. Like the stress that is associated with diabetes. You might get this cancer for that. And it is going to be a multidisciplinary approach. Many departments will be involved. The renal, the cardiovascular, the gastrointestinal, the neuro, you know, pharmacology, many will be involved. In fact, I remember one of our pros in those days said in the class the day he started the lecture on diabetes mellitus that when it was in the medical school, it was uh, a common saying then that if you know diabetes mellitus, you have known internal medicine because diabetes mellitus will affect the head down to the toe and almost all organs. So daily testing of your glucose, have that at the back of your mind. But before jumping to anything, and though I'm dealing with type two, I need to say that when it comes to type one, even when those teenagers know that they have type one diabetes mellitus, diet control is a difficult thing for them. Then, we we'll embark on medications if we are not winning here. AC inhibitors. As a matter of fact, it's now uh, modern or the, the, the way of practice that anyone with type 2 diabetes mellitus would be on AC inhibitors. Remember, angiotensin combining enzyme inhibitors are cardio renal protective. So, Placing them on Ramipri, low dose, 2.5 milligram to 5 milligram is not too much, but must watch for the blood pressure at the same time. Because while you are trying to protect the renal system and the cardiovascular system, you cannot shut the BP down and the patient will die from that. Aspirin, of course, to prevent you know, macro complications with coronary artery disease, right? And statin. Remember, I said it the other time, starting will have less you know, effect as per derangement of glucose. So we use starting to help you know, patient already diagnosed. All this in coronary artery disease prevention. Now, pharmacology. Mm -hmm. You could see by going out here. After three months or six months maximum, if we are not winning with lifestyle changes in type 2, or if on the day we assay for the glycated hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, and the value is greater than 8%, then we will start medications right away. Let me explain. 
two conditions in type two when we will begin our medications. One, if this individual had been on lifestyle changes, trying to lose weight and blah, 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 to the maximum of six months and we are not winning, or when we assayed for the level of glycated hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, and the value today has given us 8%, we will not wait for three, six months lifestyle changes. We'll go straight to the use of medications. So let's start with the one that most of us will be comfortable to start with. That is by Guanin. And the example is metformin, glucovage, 500 milligram, once daily, with meal or 500 milligram per hour twice daily. We have to rule out certain conditions before placing that man or woman on metformin. Number one, renal function. What is happening with the glomerular filtration rate? If it's less than 30 mils per minute, we should not give baguan or metformin to death. Also, if there's liver disease, no, we go ahead. In alcohol abuse, so it is not out of place to ask for history of alcohol consumption here. Congestive cardiac failure, we will not give it. And history of lactic acidosis, we will not give it. Any low tissue perfusion or hypoxic state, we will not give metformin. Why that? On its own, metformin can produce lactic acidosis. So, if all these conditions that could lead to, you know, metabolic acidosis on gram, and then you are loading the patient with metformin, then you are not helping. You are actually sending him or her to the early grave. We are done with the guanas. Now, glucagon like peptide 1. The glucagon like peptide 1 receptor agonist the examples will be liraglutide, that is Victoza, for type 1 diabetes mellitus treatment, or the brand name Sacenda, if your goal is for weight loss. So, you can grab that. Semaglutide, that is Ozempic, will come in form of injection weekly, or Rebelsos, that is another brand name of semaglutide, is used for per hour. It depends on your goal, right? Mm. The laglutide is trulicity, as an as bieta is injection or injectable form twice daily, as an extended release injection will be given weekly. I, I pray that I don't, but if somebody close to me would need any of the glucagon like peptide 1 receptor agonists, the person should just go for the weekly one and then you get each other and you are okay for a week. Um, they are increasing mimetis. So they decrease gastric emptying. So that will reduce the rate of uh, substances absorbed in the system, though thereby reducing weight, okay? And then insulin secretion from pancreas will be enhanced and only associated with glucose level after eating. That would be secretor goggle, right? Remember I said in type two, they have good pancreas, but there is insulin resistance. The low glucagon secretion will be the case when you are using these medications. The level of glucagon secretion will drop. And remember, glucagon will shoot the glucose up. We need glucagon in hypoglycemia, not in hyperglycemia. So we don't need it, so, and the drug will do just that for you. But in hypoglycemia, that will not be the case, okay? So, and then the glucagon secretion and release will be decreased. Still on glucagon-like peptide 1, they are produced in the epithelial cells of the intestine. They are released after meal intake. But they are rapidly metabolized and inactivated by an enzyme called dipeptide peptidase 4. You could see that I bought in this. Do you know why? We will come across a group of medications that is named this. 
they are going to inhibit this very enzyme. It means when they inhibit these very enzymes, the rate of metabolism of glucagon lipeptide 1 will drop. So we have more of glucagon lipeptide 1 in the circulation. That is why later on we will see that they will say that peptide peptide is 4 inhibitors and glucagon like 1 peptide are close in actions. So GLP-1 will stimulate insulin secretion and inhibit glucagon secretion. That is summary. Okay, another example is sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors. Here we have empagliflozin for power use. You can see the trade name here. Canagliflozin, that is invocana. 100 mg per hour once daily. Dapagliflozin for SIGA for power use. They have both demonstrated cardiovascular benefits by having favorable effects on BP and weight loss. Okay? And they reduce the reabsorption of fetal glucose and deliver sodium to the distal tools. With that, they promote the excretion of both the glucose and sodium. Sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas are insulin secretor gods, meaning the medication would need a functioning pancreas. Why that? Because it stimulates the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin. Example where we include glibenclamide. The trade name could be glyburide or that better. But I will not be lazy to jump without telling you that don't use this in my grandpa. So avoid this medication in the elderly. Still under sovereignurus will be glipizide, glucoral, or glucotra. No where the brand name anyways. Glyclazide is diamicron. We use this a lot. Diamicron. Glimepiride is amiride. A lot of people will use this also. But we have the first generation of alunurides like cropopamide, that is diabinase, torbutamide, that is orinase. They named functioning pancreas to work well. Meglutinides. The example will be Repaglinine and nitroglinine. They need a functioning pancreas via potassium ATP channels and thereby increasing insulin. It can be combined with metformin. Tazolidenin diodes. Examples here will be rosiglitazone, poiglitazone, troglitazone. All this, the three of them, are insulin sensitizers. They improve glucose and fat metabolism and they can alter adipokine secretion and can also reduce adipose tissue inflammation. They however have horrible effects on the heart leading to heart failure and they can also increase the weight and produce the dip. DPP4, dipeptide, peptide is 4 in beta's. Remember, I alluded to this while talking you know, about GLP1, right? The examples there will be citagliptin, sasagliptin, vidagliptin, linagliptin, allogliptin, so the gliptin family. Now, DPP4 and GLP1. DPP4 inhibitors and GLP1 receptor agonists work similarly. Remember, I've just stated it that these inhibitors will prevent the metabolism of GLP1. So they facilitate glucose dependent insulin secretion, they reduce glucagon production postprandial, and they slow down peristasis. Now, the big brother in the family, insulin. We can conveniently label insulin as the rescue agent. I have a full separate presentation on insulin alone already published right here. 
you can click on this link to lead you to that. Now, the insulin. It was first called insulin in April of 1922 from the Latin word insula, meaning an island. Why that? It was secreted by the early size of Langerhans. Thanks to Dr. Freddie Banting from Ontario in Canada, who won Nobel Prize in 1923 for this discovery. He was a surgeon who worked with his assistant, known as Charles Best. Before then, diabetes mellitus with diabetic ketoacidosis was death sentence. Now, no more. Types of insulin. Human insulin is NPH or neutral protamine agadron, regular lispro or glycine. Note this. Postprandia insulin secretion endogenously should be replicated by the exogenous insulin, but NPH and regular insulin couldn't meet that requirement. Therefore, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, in particular, a more replica ones were manufactured, and they are the Lispro, the Aspart, Glycine, Glycine, Detma, and the Glude. There are certain things to point out when it comes to insulin. Regular insulin is used for premium, but analogs, example Lispro, Aspart, and Glycine, they do add faster and shorter duration of action making them more suitable for pre-meal than regular. In the same vein, NPH for basal coverage is less preferred for the basal purpose, and why that? The analogs, the glycine dentine, or the glutec are more suitable because they have longer hours of action and they have longer plateau. NPH peaks few hours after administration and drops gradually over the day. Glycine have a long plateau, meaning the effect on glucose control is almost at the same rate for the entire 24 hours after one hour of injection. Still on coordination of times, rapid acting will be Lispro, that is Sumalog, Aspart, Novorapid, Glulisine as Apidra. The onset of action will be 3 to 15 minutes. They will peak within 40 minutes to 70 minutes, and the duration of action is within two to four hours. The regular or short acting, remember this is rapid acting, this is short acting. The regular here will be Homolin R or Novolin Toronto. The onset of action will be 30 minutes, it's gonna peak within two to four hours, and the duration of action will be six to eight hours. The intermediate acting ones will be neutral protamine lispro as NPL or humulin N, with the onset of action at two hours, peak at six, and duration of action 15 hours. Neutral protamine agadron as NPH or novolin NPH will have onset at 12, two hours, peak at four to 12, and duration of action at 12, to 16 hours. The long acting will be insulin, the glue deck, or tracebo. The onset of action here will be two hours. They don't have the specific number of hours to pick, and duration of action is greater than 40 hours. 40. The insulin detima or Levamere, we have all shade of action at two hours, peak at three to nine hours, and duration of action is six to 24 hours. Glycine or Lantos will have onset at two hours, they don't have specific number of hours to peak, and duration of action is 20 to 40 hours. For Beza, you we'll use intermediate like NPH or NPL or long acting. Know this. You may use short acting or rapid acting for beza, but it must be a continuous infusion 
or by insulin pump. I think we got that right. For BASA, you use NPH or NPL or long acting. You may choose the short acting or rapid acting, but you are going to run into a big problem because it must be by continuous infusion or you use insulin pump. The bolus, you can use short acting or rapid acting, and that should be given before meals to handle glucose surge after eating or post prandial. If you are dealing with premixed insulins, you can have regular 50, 50 NPH, lisproprotamine 25 and 75 lisproprotamine, homolin R30 and NPH 70, novolin Toronto 30 and NPH 70. You don't mix insulin glycine or insulin dietamine with any other insulins due to low pH of the diluents. Still on continuation of types, you can use immediately if NPH is mixed with regular insulin. Please use immediately. NPH with rapid acting like Lispro or Aspart is fine, but it must be taken within 15 minutes before meal. Avriza is an inhaled insulin. It is like the subcutaneous insulin Lispro. Subcute insulin is the uh, root of choice because absorption is variable as insulin depot is formed. The high pressure jet injectors would not use needle but more rapid glucose lowering. Pen injectors with prevail cartridges are available. Insulin pump therapy is available. In that case, you can use rapid acting insulin. Subcutaneous catheter will be needed. It is programmed to deliver bolus insulin at meals and continuous basal dose. The advantage here is it is very flexible. It improves the quality of life. But the disadvantage here will be that it can be disconnected inadvertently. Now, this is the insulin pen. I've decided to use my hand to draw this because of copyright issues, right? Uh, my sketch is not that so fanciful, but then it's going to convey the information. This is the cartridge filled with insulin. This is the insulin pen. You can see the needle, the needle attachment point, then insulin reservoir right here. You can adjust the amount of insulin you want to give here. This is the adjust dial. Then you press this injection button to deliver. Size for insulin injection. And somebody is asking, what is the business? Why go into that? Well, well uh, it's good. We just want to know everything about diabetes, right? The abdomen is the best site for injection of insulin. You may decide to use the tie particularly go for the top outer uh, chondron, five inches off from the nail, okay? You may use the arm, but don't exercise immediately after injection, particularly if you are using the tie, and don't fling that arm immediately after. Why that? We have to prevent fast absorption, and we must be rotating the injection size. So if you use the abdomen, if you use the uh, right side today, go for the left side tomorrow. Pinching for subcutaneous at angle 45 degree will be better. You may experience mild allergic reaction like itching, pain, redness or swelling at the size of the injection. Now, insulin regimen. Um, I will not rush through this because it's pretty important. People could die from excess insulin use, and they won't get out of the diabetic problem with inadequate use. So let's get it right. You can contact your pharmacist or your clinical pharmacologist if you are still confused. A 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 units per kg, meaning we must get the weight of this patient, and then choose between 0 0.5 times that weight 
or 0 0.7 times that weight. So whatever the figure is, that is 100 somewhere, right? Okay, we'll then divide into 4. 40%, mm -hmm, 4 over 10 of whatever total we got will serve as beta at bedtime. 20% will be as bolus at breakfast, 20% as bolus at lunch, and 20% as bolus at supper time. If we are dealing with pre-mixed, already mixed, we'll still calculate at a 0 0.5 up to 0 0.7 units per kg, right somewhere. Whatever the total is, two-third of that, of the pre-mixed, of the total value we've got in here, will be the dose we are going to give before breakfast. The remaining one third will be the dose of the premixed that we'll give before supper. In type 2 diabetes mellitus, we'll use only basal insulin. We can give 10 units at bedtime and increase by one unit until you, we can achieve the desired glucose level of less than 7.0 millimoles per liter. But we should be careful. We are not looking for less than 4 millimoles per liter, right? We will adjust as necessary. Let me admonish every diabetic patient that it's difficult, but it's necessary. We just have to cooperate with the physicians and with the nurses to help us. Actually, some patients are used to this. They can do this on their own. If sugar is high in the morning, then we have to use higher dose of beza at bedtime. If sugar is high at lunch time, then we use higher breakfast bolus. If sugar is high at supper time, then we have to increase the dose of the lunch bolus or higher morning beza. If it is increased at bedtime, then we have to increase supper bolus. Complications of insulin. Oh, so there's nothing good that may not have the bad side of it. Hypoglycemia. I'll go into details in a bit. I'll not waste your time here. Lipoatrophy or lipohypertrophy, jointly put as lipodystrophy. So we have to rotate the sides to lower the lipodystrophy or dystrophic changes. Increase in weight, and why that? Insulin is an anabolic hormone. So, if you're on need for a long time, you may be battling with weight increase so much. There's likelihood of anxiety or depression. We have to screen for suicide. There may be cough, particularly if you are using the inhaled form. Now, hypoglycemia. Remember, I've just said it that I will delve into that more, so I didn't want to waste your time. So, okay, let's go. Hypoglycemia. Can the glucose level be too low? Of course. Now, hypoglycemia. You have your random blood sugar or fasting blood sugar, and it's giving you 4.0 millimoles per liter and below, then you'll do something. What are the possible causes of this low level of glucose? Could be insulin, could be glyburin, chlorpropamine, could be associated with aspirin, warfarin, sulfonamine, alcohol, gamfibrosi, quinine, and quinidine. Because quinine and quinidine can have hyperinsulinoma, giving us severe hypoglycemia, and the list goes on. Could be as a result of low food intake. I excretion of you know, the glucose, I mean food that will be converted to glucose carbohydrate from diarrhea or malabsorption syndrome. Could be malnutrition with low glycemic storage. All this and many more could cause hypoglycemia. Okay. The causes of hypoglycemia could also include renal failure. And why that? Metabolism of many medications include glucose will be impaired. Then we'll have high levels of those medications 
in the system, leading to drop in glucose. Might be as a result of heart failure or glycogen storage disease, where the glycogen is not stored, or infants of gestational diabetes mother. When they are born, they are born with high insulin level, and if no food will match the level of the insulin, I mean glucose that will match the level of insulin, when they are born, then there will be hypoglycemia at birth. Insulinoma, that is bitter cell tumor of the pancreas, secreting excessive insulin, okay? And hypocortisol, high cortisol will give us high glucose. Now, low level of cortisol will give us low level of glucose. When there's hypoglycemia, there are certain troubles that we can run into, like adrenergic symptoms. The adrenergic symptoms will be the first to appear, and that will give tremor, palpitations, swelling, anxiety, and tachycardia. Then, if nothing is done on time, that will go down the hill to neuroglycopenic symptoms. In that case, there will be dizziness, headache, blood vision, fatigue, lethargy, confusion, scissors, coma, and death. Uh, I need to pause and let you know something here. That sometimes people become confused, they talk irrationally, they just behave somehow, and some people will be thinking of psychiatric disorder. You better check the glucose level first. It might be neuroglycopenic symptoms of hypoglycemia. So it is not all the cases of confusion that is actually due to psychiatric problem or, you know, uh, or a metabolic problem beyond glucose level alone. That's what is known as Whipple's trial. How do I mean? There is serum glucose that is less than 2.5 millimoles per liter in men or less than 2.2 millimoles per liter in women with neuroglycopenic symptoms, confusion, dizziness, even coma before death, because after that we don't need this anymore, then you assess the glucose level, you discover it is low, like you found the figure here with neuroglycopenic symptoms, then you administer your glucose in the venosy and the patient bounces back, and neuroglycopenic symptoms all disappear, if that is the case, these three, low glucose level, neuroglycopenic symptoms, you administer your glucose, the patient is fine, that is Whipple's trial. Three, low glucose, the symptoms, the treatment, and resolution. Counter regulatory hormones. Counter regulatory hormones will all increase in the face of hypoglycemia. Why that? We want the glucose to come up. All these regulatory hormones are not helpful in diabetes, but they are helpful in hypoglycemia, epinephrine, or adrenaline, glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, certain conditions like Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, fochromocytoma, and glucagonomas. We all you know, play roles here. Treatment. How do we treat hypoglycemia in diabetic patients? We have to educate the patient on the symptoms. Symptoms of adrenergic symptoms like you know, palpitations, headache, and so on. Keep life savers in your back. Because when you still have the adrenergic symptoms that will first of all appear, you'll be able to save it because once you go into Neuroglycopenic symptoms, you may not be in control anymore. If conscious and he or she is not vomiting, we can give juice or lifesavers. This is where glucose tablets will be helpful, right? If the patient is conscious and vomiting or he or she is unconscious, then the story will change. 
we have to look for something intravenously. D50 will be welcome here. You can give your glucagon if this person is on a journey. You are hiking somewhere in the bush or you're on top of a mountain and nobody's there with D50, no IV line, but you have glucagon and your needle and syringes. Now, one milligram subcutaneously. Or you have the IV fluid line, you have D50, but you cannot get the IV line, then go for glucagon. You can give IV fluid D10 or D5 the possible causes are ruled out. Glucagon is not available and every line is impossible while the patient has remained unconscious. You can give insta glucose gel. So you squeeze that into his or her mouth. All you are after is to save that life. You know why? If he or she is hypoglycemic for a long time, that is killing faster than hyperglycemia. Both can kill, but hypoglycemia will kill faster than hyperglycemia. That's why when I was given the signs and symptoms of neuroglycopenic symptoms, death has been written clearly there. Now, there's a condition known as hypoglycemia unaware. And you can ask me, how do you mean? Somebody is having hypoglycemia and he or she doesn't even know. How come? Might be they have strict glycemic control. Or this is somebody that has been diagnosed with diabetes mellitus for a long time. And they are now known to be having chronic diabetes mellitus with neuropathy. So they don't feel my stuff anymore so much or low they have low epinephrine or adrenaline production or they are hypertensive they are on beta blockers or they are in beta blocker for something else and then the level of glucose is down in them because they are on other medications for diabetes mellitus or they are not eating well they may not know because these beta blockers will block the adenergic symptoms. And without adenergic symptoms, they will not know before they will be tilted or go downhill to neuroglycopenic symptoms. And then from there into coma and death. Also, hypoglycemia unaware can happen in recurrent hypoglycemic episodes. Why that? The body would have adapted. Because this has been happening you know, over and on no, back and forth for many years. Then the body would have adapted. Oh, this palpitation is coming again. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that could be the case. So it's not everybody with hypoglycemia that will be able to tell that they do have it. Some will have it and they won't know. And these will be the category of people that will have it. Okay, there are certain diabetic emergencies. Oh, somebody is asking, is diabetes itself not an emergency? No, until certain level is reached. In type 1, DKA will be an emergency situation. Hyperglycemia, apostolar state will be you now an emergency situation in type 2. Details of this will service an emergency medicine section of my presentation. So for now, I'll say thank you, but I'll go into DK Nebe. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis. What to start with? You can click on this very link to get full info and a separate presentation by me, all on diabetic ketoacidosis. You can follow this link. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis. The affected individual is either presenting for the first time or has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus before, but not adhering to dietary control and insulin regimen. Let me explain. Remember, when we started on type 1 diabetes mellitus, I said it might be DKA 
that will be the first presentation in many of them. Meaning, they won't know that they have diabetes mellitus until they've come down with diabetic ketoacidosis. Or it might be that they've been told, they've been diagnosed, that you have diabetic ketoacidosis, but because they are teenagers, it's pretty hard for them to comply with the dietary control. They could see their friends, you know, drinking pop, and they want to drink. They've seen the ice cream, they've seen everything around. They can't take their you know, eyes away from all those things. And some of them will not be following the appropriate regimen of the insulin usage. Mortality here is about 5%. Now, what are the clinical features of diabetic ketoacidosis? Polyuria, polydipsia, polyvagia, weakness, weight loss, infection, opportunistic infections, dominant pain, dehydration. Other clinical features will include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, cosmal respiration, tachycardia, tachypnea, drowsiness, decreased level of consciousness, acetone breath, coma, and if not treated on time, death. What are the precipitating factors when it comes to diabetic ketoacidosis? Formerly, we are familiar with five eyes, but now we can say six eyes of DKA, but can still put the six in five. Okay, let's go. Infection, infarction, ischemia, insulin mix, intoxication with alcohol, illnesses that could lead to nausea, vomiting, and dehydration. That's why some would think infection and illnesses should be the same, but it's not in all cases that what will lead to nausea and vomiting and dehydration will be infection, okay? Maybe many causes, okay? Medications like steroids and second generation antipsychotics and so on, all in type one could lead to DKA. Investigations in the face of diabetic ketoacidosis. Glucose and it will be very high. Could be as high as greater than 14 millimoles per liter. That is more than twice the cutoff line. Acidosis, like pH less than 7.3 or bicarbonate less than 15 milli equivalent per liter. Metabolic acidosis. Ketones will be high in the urine. There will be increased beta hydroxybutyrate greater than three millimoles per liter. As a matter of fact, in the centers where this could be acid, this will be very, very helpful. Some will actually prefer to go for beta hydroxybutyrate acid than the ketones alone if the chance is there to abort them. Anion gap. The normal level is 8 to 14 millimoles per liter. There is a separate presentation on anaerobic metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, acid bed balance generally. I think I have about five or six presentations on that right here on my channel. Please just get to the VKMS and check them out. Decrease phosphate, decrease sodium. Decrease magnesium. Here, when there is decreased magnesium, that could lead to prolonged QT. With prolonged QT, it may degenerate to tosar the point. Tosar the point would degenerate to ventricular tachycardia, monomorphic or polymorphic. From polymorphic ventricular tachycardia to ventricular fibrillation. If there is no deep fibrillation, that can lead to asystole. With asystole, 
if no advanced cardiac life support is instituted on time, then the patient will end up in the morgue. So it is that serious. Then, a big brother, when it comes to the trouble of DKA, is the potassium. The potassium will be pretty high, but we will know in a bit the relationship between the acidosis and hyperkalemia. Still on investigations, um, blood urea nitrogen and creatinine can be on the increase. Amylase and lipase to know what's happening to the pancreas. Venous blood gas, arterial blood gas, PCO2 level. We want to know if there is compensation or none. Hemoglobin A1C, no glycator hemoglobin, to so know how bad the uh, glucose is, whether you know, glycemic control is ongoing or not. If the patient is in coma, then we should have toxicological screening also done because you might not be able to tell, might be strict drug that has added to this or certain medication prescribed or not. You can have CT of the head down because someone in coma, you might not be able to say what has happened you know, before now. If raised amylase and lipase, then we have to check for the level of cash. Okay, we can classify DKA into mild, moderate, or severe based on the level of the pH, the level of, of acidosis. It is bad when pH is between 7.2 to 7.3. It is moderate when the pH has dropped to 7.1 or less than 7.2. It is severe when the pH is below 7.1. Treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. First thing first, we check the airway. Any foreign body, any secretion, sanction as appropriate, make sure it is patent. Then we we'll move to the B and it's breathing. Any peripheral cyanosis, central cyanosis, respiratory rate, you auscultate for bright sounds, any of your disformity, tracheal deformation, is the chest moving with respiration? Moving with the abdomen or not. We go to the C circulatory system, ending dehydration, capillary filling. What is the blood pressure? What's the heart rate? Any IV fluid ongoing, fluid in and out, past the catheter right now, and so on. We get two IV lines set up. No, Foley is catheter for bladder catheterization. IV fluid at 20 mins per kilogram of normal setting. We have to check for the renal function. Vital size machine should be hooked up. Fluid in and out should be monitored. We have to calculate the deficit. We must rule out such by having, you know, septic walkup because you don't want to have a seeming shock. That must be ruled. We will have to replace the deficit with half cell. Now, what is the role of insulin in DKA? We must start insulin infusion at the rate of 0 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. We will change to IV fluid D10 or D5 in our selling when glucose drops to 15 down to 14 millimoles per liter. Okay? Then we'll continue the IV fluid D10 or D5 once the glucose is at this level, okay, until the patient is awake. Until he or she can take power, we'll continue with this. Glucose will drop, potassium will drop, and sodium level will normalize with insulin administration. Remember, in hyperkalemia treatment, 
we make use of insulin and glucose. Why that? When you give your insulin, if you don't give glucose, you kill the patient with hypoglycemia. But your insulin will help drive the potassium back into the cell. Now the potassium. There's no way to deal with diabetic ketoacidosis without thorough, thorough management of potassium. Decreased pH, that is acidosis, will increase potassium and then acidosis. It is fair to say that metabolic acidosis is characterized by low pH and increased potassium. Potassium draws when acidosis is corrected. So, you may not lay your hands on potassium per se if you are skillful at correcting the metabolic acidosis, because potassium will drop when acidosis is corrected. If potassium is greater than 5.5 milli equivalent per liter, please let's check what is happening to the heart. We must get the EKG done and we'll continue our insulin infusion and then repeat the lab in one hour. I'll go into the list of what to check and when to check them in a bit. When potassium is between 5.5 to 3.5 milli equivalent per liter, then we will not teach this patient to hypokalemia. So we have to put potassium chloride at 20 milli equivalent per liter up with the insulin infusion. When the potassium is less, than 3.5 mg per liter, then we're in trouble. We're about treating this patient to hypokalemia, which is not good. Hypokalemia is not good. Hypokalemia is not encouraging. So we'll stop insulin infusion you know, altogether. Add potassium less than 3.5 mg per liter, please. And then we'll add 40 mg per liter of potassium chloride. Why that? This is not good for the heart. Okay, monitoring. What are we monitoring and when? Vital signs should be monitored every hour. Thanks to the wonderful nurses, they know how to do this. They are ready, they are prepared for it. Fluid in and out should be monitored every hour. Neurological status should be monitored every hour. Blood glucose every hour. So, the nurse gets there every one hour, she will go through all this. Thanks to them. Still on monitoring, what are we going to monitor every two hours? Electrolytes. Yeah, every two hours, we must know the value of potassium, sodium, and chlorine every two hours. Arterial blood gas, venous blood gas, every two hours and beta adosive butyrate every two hours. Every four hours, we'll monitor you know, for certain stuff, like the value of calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Someone is saying, so not as important as potassium. Mm -hmm. Always replace potassium and phosphorus together, please. Okay, disposition. And someone is asking, how do you mean? Well, simply saying, how, when, and to whom are we going to discharge this patient? So, we will not just send this patient home just like that. Oh, in coma, now back. Okay, bye. See you again or don't see you again. No. We will continue to give subcutaneous insulin when the patient is awake and eating. Then, We'll check the glucose level again to know what the value is right now. We'll now sit down with this patient. Now that you can talk to me, okay, I want to know more about this. Because this is going to happen in the emergency room, right? This is not a patient you've been handling for a long time. So, when were you diagnosed with diabetes mellitus? Then you'll go over the signs and symptoms again. And how did you come down with this today? Like I said, this might be the first time the boy, the girl, the man or woman will be having this. DK might be the first thing that will happen before the diagnosis of type 1 will take place. So 
you might be the first doctor that will make the diagnosis fully today. So full history, social, everything, what is happening to your diet, you comply if already diagnosed before, are you taking your insulin or this patient doesn't even have enough money to buy the insulin we involve social workers right now. We'll have complete physical examination though, you know somebody who had been in coma could be caused by anything right, any sign of trauma here. So we'll do complete examination from general inspection to cardiovascular to respiratory to neuro, even to musculoskeletal. Okay. Then we want to those who have been diagnosed before and already on insulin, we want to know the type of insulin they are taking, the dosage, and then we'll involve the diabetic educator in big centers that have that. So they will come in. Of course, they will help also, but we need to document our own findings and that will help their own or corroborate it. Then we will address any psychosocial issues. Yeah, not living with the parents or this person might even be homeless, might be on the street. Then how do you want him or her to be able to do all these things? And how will he or she comply with you know, your prescription, taking the medications and coming to see you periodically or having necessary tests done to know the level of the sugar? Then we have to discharge to his or our family physician. It's okay to say, okay, you can go home now, been taking this and this, and then teach the diabetic educators will teach them how to inject the insulin, right? But you can do that as well, and then diabetic educator will you know, augment whatever you are doing. Okay, so um, the charge to the family physician will be contacted directly, and they will follow up, or will be given the call when to come for follow. And with that, we are fine with diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, you've done everything. The patient is on his way now, but we should remember, certain complications are possible if you're on uh, a long-term issue with diabetes mellitus. Venous thromboembolism, that's pulmonary embolism, deven thrombosis, it's very possible. Cerebral injury, pancreatitis, and death in some. Now, hyper osmolar hyperglycemic state or hyperosmolar non-cathotic state. This is going to happen in type 2 patients. Mortality here is horrible, it's about 50%. So 50% of people with type 2 diabetes that will come down with upper smaller upper glycemic state, as some will call upper or smaller non ketotic state, will actually die. 50% will die. What are the precipitating factors that will teach type 2 patients into HHS or HONK? Drugs like diuretics, cyclosporine glucocorticoids, fentoin. They are not just taking these drugs on their own, diuretics, maybe for hypertension, no, glucocorticoids and fentoin. Some have um, so many, con this is uh, for uh, immune suppression in autoimmune condition, glucocorticoids are their autoimmune condition or asthma or COPD or fentoin or to those who have seizure disorder and so on. So not just on their own self way, right? But we should be careful. Once somebody is having type 2 diabetes and is on all these medications and more, might come down with this and 50% of them may die. Stroke could be a precipitant also of HHS, renal failure, congestive cardiac failure, myocardial infarction, sepsis, stress, for example, bonds or surgery, and even dialysis. The pato here in HHS is that the presence of low amount of insulin will prevent lipolysis. Therefore, no ketosis, 
but lower glucose utilization by muscle and subsequent release of glucose from glycogen will be the problem. Okay, so the diabetes mellitus complications will be in two groups. The microvascular complications and macrovascular complications. You can check my channel here for both. I have the two links already you now supplied right there. So check them for microvascular complications of diabetes mellitus and macro, macrovascular complications of diabetes mellitus. Now, microvascular complications. Let me start with the retinopathy. In retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, because there's hypertensive retinopathy. In diabetic retinopathy, that will be the leading cause of blindness in diabetic patients. It is a common cause of blindness in North America. The clinical features of diabetic retinopathy could be picked on ophthalmoscopy when you view the fundus. And the next thing to do here is to refer to the ophthalmologist. Cataract or lens opacity is non-vascular, although diabetes could be responsible for cataracts. In nephropathy, this will be the common cause of renal failure, that is diabetic nephropathy. Here we can do albumin to creatinine ratio at the first visit and then repeat that every year in type 2 diabetes. Intensive investigations in type 1 it will start after five years of diagnosis of type 1, while investigations when it comes to nephropathy will start in type 2. The first time we we'll make the diagnosis and then annually. I think we got the picture right. If the patient is with type 1 diabetes mellitus, we'll start investigating for diabetes nephropathy after five years of diagnosis. But if it is type 2, we'll start investigating for diabetic nephropathy, immediately the diagnosis is made, and then every year. We should prevent further damage to the nephrons by stopping all nephrotoxic medications by the use of cardiorenal protective medications like angiotensin combining enzyme beaters like Ramipri, but if there is hypersensitivity to that, you can change to angiotensin receptor blockers. Even if there is no hypertension, that is now the rule. But we should be careful that the BP is not too low. Then we must keep the blood pressure at 130 to 80 millimeters of mercury. That is the goal of the blood pressure in diabetic patients in adults. Now, neuropathy. The culprits in neuropathy will be subito rice and myoinositol low level. The excess advanced glycation end product like lipids and proteins that become glycated after exposure to glucose will be associated trouble leading to neuropathy. Oxidation will also lead to neuropathy and protein kinase C will not be left out as part of the corporate there. Non growth factors that are low will lead to problems. Now, how will diabetic neuropathy present? We present with paresthesia, that is tingling or itching, numbness, and so on. Neuropathic pain, localized pain, particularly if we are dealing with radiculopathy. The numbness, low sensation, particularly low tactile, copper tunnel syndrome, also will have food neuropathic ulcerations and bells pulsing. 
Continuation of neuropathy will include diabetic mellitus amyotrophy, where there will be pain, weakness, wasting of hip flexors and extensors, autonomy you know, neuropathy will present with alternate constipation and notional diarrhea. I think we can get that. Autonomic neuropathy of diabetic mellitus will present with alternate constipation and nocturnal diarrhea. Also, autonomic dysfunction will present with erectile dysfunction, urinary retention, and high heart rate and postural hypotension. All this will be pointing to autonomic neuropathy of diabetic mellitus. Examination when it comes to neuropathy. We have diabetic mellitus foot examination. That will involve general examination for peripheral vascular disease and neurological examination for sensory, as is light or sharp touch and dull and pain and so on. We can use proprioception and 24 for vibration or monofilament. Now, how do we treat neuropathy that is associated with diabetes mellitus? Adjuvance therapy in pain management. You can check my channel for full presentation you know, in pain treatment, okay? Then, tricyclic antidepressant. You can check my channel also for full presentation on no epinephrine. So here, you can use amitriptyline, no epinephrine. If it's an elderly person, no epinephrine is more tolerated than amitriptyline. But let's remember, we may be running into serious cardiovascular problems, and remember anticholinergic effects when you are going for tricyclic antidepressant. The same anticholinergic effect could be picked in serotonin, selective reoptic inhibitors also. So you can use Selective nor epinephrine reopting beetles that is in butter, that is dulocytin. You can check my channel for that. I have a full presentation on that as well. And you can go for anticonvulsants, for example, Tegretol, that is carbamazepine. Remember, carbamazepine was originally manufactured for the treatment of tic doloru, that is trigeminal neuralgia. The neurontin or lyrica, that is pregabalin or gabapentin. Vortorine cream or capsaicin for topical application can be used. You can address erectile uh, dysfunction, no, erectile dysfunction rather, using Cialis, Viagra, or Levitra. But be careful, please. And that must be the choice of the patient. And at the same time, make sure that the cardiovascular system is in intact, you know, in, is, is in good shape. And that's the BP is not on the downward end. Okay. You may choose erythromycin if you have any reason to handle um, infectious diseases, bacteria in origin and susceptible to microlites uh, to treat standing diabetic mellitus patient. Why that? If you suspect autonomic neuropathy because it increases gastric emptying if the individual is constipated. But Erythromycin may prolong the QT, and you know what that will mean. From prolonged QT to tosal the point, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, asystole, and death. And domperidone and metoclopramide will also be helpful when it comes to, you know, increase in peristalsis as the need in autonomic uh, neuropathy. Thanks for that. And that will be the end of uh, neuropathy treatment. Now, macrovascular complication. So the question is, are there more organs that will be affected by the long-standing diabetes mellitus? The answer is yes. Okay, macrovascular complications. Coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, Mesenteric ischemia, ischemic stroke, all this. So, in diabetes mellitus, 
the proper thing is to cooperate with your physician or else you run into a lot of troubles. So the heart will be in trouble, the cardiovascular system will be in trouble, you can have a heart attack, and when you are getting older, you run into mesenteric ischemia. Even when you are not old, you can have you no know, mesenteric ischemia or infarction that will lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. Ischemic stroke is possible. In fact, you can have repeated ischemic stroke. You get out of it today, you come back in the next one or two years or more once the diabetes is not under control and the lipid is there and other associated factors. That is why you cannot be smoking and have diabetes and you are obese. Then it means you must rise your weight, right? Um, still on macrovascular complications, atherosclerosis, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, here in peripheral vascular disease, we have to check for lower extremity amputation. Claudication, that is when you walk, you feel pain at your calf. So find out, how many blocks will you walk before you feel that pain and is it worse at a certain time, like winter time or so? Foot ulceration, we check that, we remove the shoes, remove the socks, we check the you know, interdigital you know, areas for ulcers and everything. Intestinal angina or mesenteric ischemia, usually sudden. It's gonna be mild to severe abdominal pain blood in stool, the individual is confused, or there's diarrhea, we check for all those, may lead to gangrene and intestinal perforation, okay? Intestinal obstruction may be what we follow when there's fibrosis and scarring after the individual has recovered from mesenteric ischemia. So this is a big problem. In fact, diabetes on its own is a big problem and will fail for everybody that will be diagnosed with this horrible disease. So the best thing is cooperate with your physician. Don't smoke, don't add to this problem. Don't drink alcohol, don't add to this problem. You could see there could be intestinal obstruction from diabetes. Why that? Once there's mesenteric ischemia, even when the individual will feel that, okay, I'm now out of the mesenteric ischemia, but carrying and fibrosis has already occurred. Yeah? Although you have recovered, but then something had occurred before recovery, then now you are done with intestinal obstruction. Treatment. You can add GLP-1 agonists like glutide or DPP-4 inhibitors like empagliflozin. Why that? They have cardiovascular benefits. But I'm not in favor of one medication over the other. I'm just presenting the facts here. I don't know the manufacturing uh, companies for these drugs. I'm just presenting the facts. Vaccination. Hmm. Do I need to take some vaccines? You asking me? Okay, let me supply the answer. Yes, you have to. Even if you don't have DM, you have to. Now that you've been diagnosed with DM, you must take some for you to enjoy your life or if you need to travel. Okay, let's go. Now, vaccination, flu vaccine, yes. TDAV or TD, mm -hmm. COVID-19 vaccine, correct. Zusta, yes. Human pavloma virus, mm -hmm. hepatitis B, yeah. Pneumococcal vaccines, absolutely. Now, flu shot. That is going to be done annually. Actually, some jurisdictions will place priority on people with diabetes mellitus and other chronic diseases to have their flu shot if there's shortage of flu vaccines in the community. So don't deprive yourself. Government will have you in mind. Now, hepatitis B vaccine. That would be necessary if you have never completed the series of hepatitis B vaccine and now you are diagnosed with diabetes mellitus. If you are younger than 60 and there's no complete hepatitis B vaccination before now, then you should have it. If you are older than 60, it then depends on your need. For example, you will likely be exposed to hepatitis B based on your occupation as a nurse 
or as a physician or as a lab you know technician blah 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 or you have already been exposed like you've had needle prick and you are greater than 60 you would need you know, hepatitis b vaccine and immunoglobulin right now um the series is at zero one month and six months it's expected to last a lifetime or at least 10 years but you may get a booster after five years if you have been exposed Human papilloma virus. If you are immunocompetent, then you have two doses at six months apart. If you are between ages nine to 15 years, you will take three doses if uh, the onset of your human papilloma vaccination is from ages 15 up to 26. GARA CE is now approved for both male and female use from ages 9 to 45. But note this no human papilloma virus immunization or vaccination if the individual is immunocompromised or she's pregnant. Now, TDAP and TD. TDAP for adults, DTAP for children. Hmm. Now, if you haven't received the series, you need TDAP right now. A dose of TDAP is needed in a pregnant woman from 17 to 36 weeks of the pregnancy, and it's expected in each pregnancy. TDAP is one time in life, but once in each pregnancy for pregnant women, you need booster every 10 years. But that time, it's not going to be TDAP, it will be TD every 10 years. Oh, still on vaccination, Susta or Shingus. Yeah, you need that right now if you are 50 or older and just been diagnosed with diabetes mellitus. You need two doses in the series. You know what Shingo is all about? Okay. When you become immunocompromised, then it will show off with serious pain. They will tell you it doesn't cross midline, but we now know it can cross the midline in severe immunocompromised status. A pneumococcal conjugate vaccination, that is Prevna 13. From Pfizer, Osinoflores, PCV10 from Glazosmin Clean. Pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, that is Pneumovirus 23. No, well, that is polysaccharide, right? This is conjugate vaccine, and this is polysaccharide vaccine, as PPSV23. Those are the two types, two types for pneumococcal vaccination. The conjugate vaccine, if it's from Pfizer, it's going to bear the name Prevna. It's going to have 13. And Sinoflores is from Glazosmin. We have 10. But the polysaccharide will be Pneumovirus 23. The vaccination here is that Pneumococcus PVC 13, that is Prevna 13, or Sinofri uh, 10, PCV 10. You need one dose if you are greater than 65 years with decreased immunity or you don't have spleen. The polysaccharide, one dose now, if you are between 19 to 64 years. If you are greater than 65 years, you need polysaccharide first, then you will take another dose after five years. No, the first one now, polysaccharide, and then another dose of the polysaccharide the next five years, and you repeat every 10 years. You are greater than 65 years, but you had received conjugate vaccine before, then we will not repeat conjugate vaccine in you anymore. Then at least one year after the conjugate vaccine, you will take the polysaccharide, that is PPSV23. You will then continue the series of 
polysaccharide 23, after five years, you take the second dose and you will repeat the next one in 10 years time. Now, diabetes mellitus and COVID-19 vaccine. Let's face the fact. You will be on priority list for COVID-19 vaccine if you are diagnosed with diabetes mellitus, know that. So, don't stay at home. Don't be scared of anything. Go out and get the shot. So, diabetes mellitus patient and the complications of diabetes mellitus will be added risk factors that may increase the severity and even mortality in anyone with COVID-19 infection. Note this. DM, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases all will increase mortality by almost three times the rate in the rest population. So when that is known, nobody will hide the COVID-19 vaccine away from you. Please go and get it. COVID vaccination should be a top priority in DM patients. Why that? To reduce the severity and mortality already associated with DM and COVID-19 infection combined. Now, you may take the following vaccines based on certain condition or situations. Hepatitis A, two doses at 6 to 18 months apart if you are traveling or it's just by your choice. You can take Mrs. Mom's rubella if you are young and you've never had it before. Hemophilus influenza B if you don't have spleen anymore for many reasons or you're traveling to an endemic zone. And you could cook a B if you are Esplenium, 23 and younger and traveling. Men ACWY, if you are Esplenium, you are 21 and younger and living in overcrowded place like university hostels or you need booster if last dose is before age 16. Varicella, you may take if you've never had chicken paws or never vaccinated or you are vaccinated but you didn't complete the doses. Now, first, doses at 12 months to 15 months, and second, at 4 to 6 years. Oh, finally, in conclusion, kindly take time to listen again and again. If you are able to listen to this presentation from A to Z, you have less questions or questions to bother your physicians with. Share with your friends on your different platforms worldwide. Act on all these things and make that little contribution to a human race by staying around for a long time to support your family and friends. And when you share with those who have this or those who have the history in their families, you might be able to watch against it or be able to help their loved ones the more. Also, for medical students, nursing students, practicing physicians and nurse practitioners, no, this will help greatly. In English, I say thank you. And then I wanted to figure out where all these will be. Gracias, Grazie, Ashkru, Shukran, Denke, Jesukriya. That account to the end of this presentation. Please remember to subscribe to my channel. Remember to share this presentation with many people. And then remember to leave your comment, give thumbs up as the case may be. I appreciate it.